twitchy witchy. Yep, looks like we're live. Excellent. Yes, there we go. Okie cokey. All right, mate. Well, let's uh, let's start. Just stretch, stretch it out. out. Stretch it out, mate. Get the forearms working for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> I've been going to the gym a bit, so it's more that it's the pecs that are a bit oh, sore. Nice. Right? Getting swole, mate. Getting swole. Yeah, mate. Try, trying to. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's kick it off. All right. Hi, guys, and welcome to the Performing Musicians Podcast. Today, I'm lucky enough to chat to Mr. Andy McGarvey, singer, songwriter, and guitarist extraordinaire. How are you, mate? Good, Ben. Thank you for having me. Really uh, looking forward to having a chat to you. And um, talking about things COVID and music. Lovely. And so, just to kick us off, do you want to tell us a bit about yourself? What do you do, and how long have you been doing it? Okay. Uh, I am a singer, guitarist. I'm a guitarist principally. I started really actually as a drummer and then that became a guitarist when in my sort of year eight uh, rock band, the sort of the other guitarist, or the, the, my friend Ryan who was playing guitar, he, he was sort of getting more attention and the egomaniac that was inside <laughs> of me thought, hang on a minute, I want that attention too. So we, our band then had two guitarists and we got a different drummer. Um, of course, that means like so many other guitarists that I'm now a very frustrated drummer. Yep. And every drum kit that I come across, I can't help myself but get on. Um, but uh, I have been a guitarist and a guitar player for 20 some years. And um, I'm a singer, uh, that, again, I sort of became a singer out of necessity, you know, it just became easier to, to sing songs that I wrote and sing and do gigs and do, you know, when I was starting out and just being, playing down the, the very local pub and I'm talking a very small kind of tiny bar down in my street that uh, didn't realise that we were underage until, I don't know, some months or maybe <laughs> even a year after we'd been playing there. Excellent. You know. What are you boys doing tomorrow? Oh, we got school. You got school. Oh, How no. Old are you? <laughs> and we were like, oh, 17. And like, like, we've been seven years old. Anyway, but that was there, sort of the beginnings, you know, and, and it was just easier to be a singer as well. Um, and so I've been doing that ever since and uh, teaching. You know, I've taught in schools and I, I'm back teaching in schools at the moment. Um, uh, teaching online, doing all of the sort of things that musicians do on the side of gigs, you know, yep. um, which, you know, as, as you, I'm sure know, includes recording, includes um, session, uh, you know, gig session work for people. It includes covers gigs. It includes all sorts of collaborations and basically just anything that is to do with music, which was everything. And we'll come to this later on. It was everything in my life up until 2020. And then 2020, bum, bum, bum. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then things things changed a little bit, but but music is still my principal love. And uh, guitars, you can see, or if you're listening, you can imagine behind me. Um, I have a, I am obsessed with guitars. I, I grew up obsessed with various things, whether it was Lego or or the Titanic. I became obsessed with the Titanic trucks. All of these things, you know, and so um, guitars have replaced trucks, pedal boards have replaced Lego, <laughs> and uh, and it's just it's just you know part of being a sort of male, you know, it's just being obsessed with things. That's and amazing. So that's where we're at now, that's all. Who knows man. where it will take me in the future? But maybe I'll build guitars out of Lego. Mate, I would, I would, I'll pay for one of those. I'll put them on. I'll all put right. that on pre-order. I'll put you down for the first one when I get it done. Prototype, nice one. And so, yeah. where, where are you from originally? Sorry, originally from Melbourne, um, Australia, and have been, you know, spent the majority of my life living here. I did live for a few years in London um, from 2017. But, uh, yeah, the majority of my life has been in and around Melbourne, which is a very rich music scene, you know, and yeah. it really is. A city that punches well above its weight in terms of the 
quality versus population you know yeah and i think that that's I, I was very lucky to be in this city my whole life you know yeah um not only to be you know not only to be in australia and, and it's it's quite a lucky country but also just to be in this city i didn't have to move to get to the music city yeah yeah know? i mean i think also yeah. melbourne's melbourne's probably one of the most one of the city's most like a European city as well, as far as diversity and cultural influences mm -hmm. from, you know, the Greek and the Italians and the Lebanese and everything yeah. have got, you know, the, I think, was it the, the second largest Greek population city is actually Melbourne? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Outside of Athens, uh, it's the next one's Melbourne. That is true. That is true. That's why there's good well, coffee they... and good seafood, mate. Oh, uh, and I mean, look, that, that's the thing, you know, we are spoiled for choice in terms of the things that we are um that we just take for granted especially around food and and coffee you know and you become sort of a snob <laughs> as you travel around the world and you just i hate to admit it but i did feel that like oh this coffee's just not as good as melbourne and i'd be in london and be like oh it's an australian cafe i'll i'll go to that the coffee will be good yeah. But it's true, you know, you get outside of any major capital cities and coffee is generally terrible when it's in anywhere other than Italy or Australia. Oh, it's woeful. Yeah. It's woeful. Like the, the cost of coffee. I mean, what what is that? And people love it in the UK. They That's love what, it. People talk about it. It's like, oh, I, Nero, Nero or Costa. It's like, what is the difference? <laughs> it's exactly the same thing. You know, but that's that's just what you're used to, I suppose. You know, the um, I love I love that in Melbourne, Starbucks failed as a business. That's fantastic. Yeah, so it, there's still some stores, but they came here I don't know 15 years ago or something and opened up a hundred stores or whatever, and most Melbournians were like, no thanks, we're not drinking that. <laughs> and so there's now only a few stores left in kind of major shopping centres and in the CBD. And that's it. That's the best thing I've ever heard. Yeah, it's great. Um, it's great. So do you, when, when you sort of, when you were growing up, was your household musical? Were your parents musical people or was it just sort of, were you a bit of a freak in that nature or? My grandmother uh, is musical um, and she will probably uh, say now she was because she doesn't play anymore, but I, I still think she is. She's just 94 years old and she just lost the ability you know to to enjoy it i think because everything gets harder but but she was musical and so she or she had um i guess the the genetic thing comes from there but certainly not the um the musical language you know she she played viola and piano and she couldn't remember music without it being in front of her to right. save her life yeah, yeah you know late, later in her life she would um play at the kindergarten up the road from her house, just play piano, they'd play, you know, Mary the Lamb or whatever for the kids. And she had to take sheet music with her. Isn't that all amazing? The time. Couldn't remember, yeah. Whereas she would try to get me to play something with her when I was younger on the piano. And she'd put music in front of me and I, I just couldn't, I couldn't make sense of it. But yeah. And, you know, I'd play everything by ear. So that was, that was the major difference. And, and I think that, uh, so between that and then between that, um, my, my dad was big into jazz, um, not as a not as a musician, but just as a fan. He loved jazz and he loved uh, sort of strange things like Ravi Shankar. He, he was really into oh, sort cool. of uh, sort of this weird psychedelic hangover, I guess, that followed him um, alongside kind of I don't know more traditional. Um, music of the era of my mum which was yeah, Zeppelin and the Beatles and Joni Mitchell and stuff like that so between uh, dad had Deep Purple and stuff dad introduced me to the Made in Japan the live album yes. I don't know if you've heard that oh man absolutely man a massive Deep album, Purple fan bro but that album sounds so exciting to listen to as a live album and there's not many albums that genuinely sound like man this is everything about this is really grabbing me you know yep. there's no there's no holds barred on that record. It's so good. So between I, that and Led Zeppelin 4, mum played Led Zeppelin 4 and I was hooked. Man, I still remember my old man, I was listening to, when I first started playing guitar, I was listening to like Metallica, Anthrax, Megadeth, like um, I think maybe even like bands like Death and Deicide. Like I was just a total metalhead. Mm -hmm. My old man came in, I was listening to some 
I think it was, I don't know, this is sort of mid-80s or late 80s. And so it was like whatever the heaviest thing at the time was. And uh, my old man came in. He's like, "Oh, that's that's pretty interesting music, you know. It's all very, that's all good. But have you heard this stuff?" And I was like, "Piss off, Dad! You don't know what music yeah. is, you know. Like whatever, yeah. whatever." Yeah. And he gave me Led Zeppelin one, two, and three. Mm-hmm. He gave me Black Sabbath, Paranoid. Yeah. And he gave me um, Deep Purple, Machine Head. And I was like, right. I was like, okay, I'll listen. I'll hear me, your old man. And I listened to it, and I was just like. I was like Richie yep. Richie Blackmore. I said, like, "How is this guy from twenty years ago? You know, like how is this guy yeah. like this good? Yeah, like yep. twenty years ago. Like he was like some of those stuff, like Highway Star and stuff like that. Like yep. they're recording that in the late sixties, you know, early seventies. But that guitar playing is at such a ridiculous level. And then the keyboards, like John Lord and everything, like John Lord, yeah. just mental. And the you know yeah, the is. vocals and everything. It was just like." And then when I heard man. like Led Zeppelin three, I was just I don't know what's happening, man. So uh, it was so uh, yeah. I got to thank the old man for doing that. Yeah, and there's I think that there's there's few. I mean, they they exist. I'm I'm certainly not going to sit here and be one of those people who says music is not what it used to be. But commercial music is certainly not what it used to be. Not in the seventies. Um, so, yeah, so it's harder to find those bands that are doing really really exciting things. You know. Um, but the other side of it too, which may or may not factor into it, but I, th- I reckon it does, is that everybody expects everything to be exactly to the sort of level that they expect every time they see it. Yeah. So bands yeah. seem to not be willing to take risks. So there's everything's on track, you know, everything's to the same tempo, everything's got to be pitch corrected and whatever because it's all being filmed, it's all going to be put online. And as we know well, it only takes five seconds of somebody's missing a note. I mean, Who's the poor guy from um, uh, Nick Jonas? You know Nick Jonas from the Jonas Brothers? And he tried to play the guitar, guitar solo. solo yeah. And he missed the notes. And he absolutely cocked it up. There's no doubt about it. But, man, the vitriol that the poor guy received, at least he was doing it live. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I'm sure there's recordings of, of Led Zeppelin and there's definitely recordings of, like, say, um, Sabbath and, and Iggy and the Stooges. I don't know, some of the recordings of them are just like, they are so wasted and that's terrible. <laughs> but, you know, they didn't expect anyone else to hear it. But it's also, that's interesting, isn't it? Because it's the, the, that dichotomy also has raised the level of skills so high. Like, I know when I get online now and I'm looking around at, like, the young up-and-coming, like, guitar shredders, like, even in the glory days of, like, 80s, like, Shrapnel Records and Richie Kotzen and all the, you know, Blues Saraceno and all these... You know, Ingway and all like Nuno, yeah, Nuno, Nuno is like my, you know, one of you know we have a, we have a mutual hero there, and like it's like yeah. that those guys were freakish standouts. Like those guys, yeah. you know, the majority of skill level was here because you couldn't just walk to your computer and access the entire universe. So yeah. conversely, with that, like you know, everyone's a little bit scared. But also everyone's like got such a higher skill level now. Like there is just, you know, you go to Instagram and every second guy you run across is just like breathtakingly technically amazing. Yes. But there's yes. there's not as much there's not as much I don't know. It feels to me like it's very homogenous a lot of what's what happens now. So you get mm-hmm. you get these movements through music. Like we were just talking off mic about like the Neo Soul stuff and all that sort of gear, and it's like now everyone's doing this. So if you're not doing this, you're not going to go viral. If you're not going to go viral, then you what are you even doing with your life? Yeah. You yeah, know, that's we, right. There's not as much I mean, you know, obviously this is generalizing to the hundredth degree, but there's not as much of that like really following that path, whatever it is. There's there's more <clears> like I've got to do this clip. I've got to I've got to put an Instagram video out once a week twice a week, three times a week. It's got to be a minute long and it's got to have this, this, this yeah. in it to appeal to this demographic. And the sad thing is it works. Yeah, it, but it works for what? Like, and this is the this is the question that I think that I ask of it. It's just like, what, what does that achieve for me? Like, I guess there are people like Josh Smith is a good example of someone who, oh, you so know, good. he was a session dude, but he's, he's come 
onto Instagram and explored. And I mean, I'll admit, I'd never heard of Josh Smith before. He was sort of, I discovered on, on the Instagram algorithms. And he does full gigs and releases full albums and does all of these things. But there's a lot of people that come up in my algorithms that I see time and time again, and I can't think of any of their names now, but you will know them. Your algorithm will show you the same thing, I'm yep, sure. Yep. But I don't know any albums from them. I only know one minute clips of them going, you know. Even even Matthias has just taken a break from Instagram, Instagram for this yeah. whole reason. You know, yep. he, he said, I, I don't want to play this game, you know. And all oh, power to him. He doesn't have to play that game anymore. But um, I, think there's I, also... I have read it with him where he said he hated it from the outset. Yeah. I think there's also a reason why someone like Josh Smith has exploded. And why, um, who's the guy that does homeschooling? Um, oh, Tom Bukovac. Tom Bukovac. There's a, there's a reason why those guys immediately went mega huge. Is because... Yeah they bring with them a cachet of history and gravitas through yeah. them following a path. Like Josh Smith is a prime example. He's yeah. like, you were at the borderline gig, weren't you? I was. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. So to go and see him live and I, I actually like, I, I was aware of him for a, like a reasonably long time just through Joe Bonamassa and things like that. Sure. But I wasn't like a massive fan. And then I saw that gig live at the borderline. And I mean, <clears throat> That 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 blew me away, man. Like, yeah, that's one of the best live guitar performances I've ever seen. Yes, you know, and it's not. Um, he's not perfect. Like, he's not a great singer. Like, no. his his vocals are like I I bought you know I bought a bu bunch of his albums and stuff, and his vocals are you know at at times, you know, they're, they're just rough. Well, Eric, he's a, he's a um. A guitarist yeah. that is trying to sing. He's not a singer that also plays guitar. That's right. But I mean, to yeah. see to see that as a as a thing, like as a, to go and experience that as a as a snapshot of what he does was just <laughs> so huge. And he brought that to Instagram. And I think there's a different, there's a completely different level there between someone that's that's carved out a path, you know, of, of the blues and jazz and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. And then brought it to Instagram rather than building it from Instagram. You sure. Know? And guys like yep. M Mateus, like he, he would have probably been fairly successful in no matter what he did because he's got such a beautiful touch and his phrasing's you know magical. And but yep. he he really became successful from Instagram. Like totally. That was his that was his platform where Josh Smith and you know Bukovac were already successful. They just brought what they did to social media, and I think. I think that's not better. It's got I, more longevity. It's got though. more longevity. That's the word I'm looking for. I'm, I'm certainly one to check back to Tom Bukovac. I really like his little meanderings, but yep. you know he, that's because he clearly knows what he's talking about. And there's no bullshit. There's no like flashy um, clickbaity headline or anything like that. Or you know everything's got to have the YouTube. Um, it's got like someone going. Yeah, and they point to their, you know, their whatever their title is. It's like this is ridiculous. Whereas his has none of that. Yep. You know, it's just a guy sitting in his webcam talking about the guitar. Yeah, uh, and because he can do that, you know. Well, he's played and on you know about a billion Nashville sessions. So well, that's right. But man, his his playing is beautiful in every style that I've heard him do. Yeah, you know, he's got he's got the language. He's not really faking it he really has all of the language down yeah and uh and i mean that's that's the other thing too like he's 50 odd years old like that that takes time to get to that point you know absolutely such and such whoever that um no disrespect at all to uh the who's that band with those young you know those young po polyphia you know oh no those guys to them at all. I think that they're incredible players, you yep. know, and they write some cool tunes that clearly are resonating with people, but they only can do that thing. Yes. And I don't I don't think that they could sit in on any other gig. Well, I've seen you know? them do a, um, I can't remember their names, but I know who you mean. And I've seen them do a live thing with, I think it was Satch and Vi and like um, Tosa Nabasi and a bunch of guys. Oh, yeah. And yep. they just, I mean... And all, and once again, w what you said is completely correct. They have a thing that they're doing, mm -hmm. and it's unique to them. 
Yep. And that sort of, it sort of goes beyond, like the like the heavy riffing sort of thing. It's it's very lyrical. It's very musical. You know, and mm-hmm. they work really. They bounce off each other in stereo and. But when they get up on stage with a bunch of these guys have been doing it for 30, 40, 50 years, they just looked ridiculous. Like, they honestly just looked silly. They're try- sure. They were trying to pull these moves, and it, it was just falling flat. It's also, you know, you, you, you're you playing with some of the greatest musicians in the world, and they are really good. But yeah. as you say, they haven't got them, you know, they're young cats. They haven't got the miles on the, on the, on the, on the, on the face yet. <laughs> but the other thing, too, I think that is difficult with that style of music Um is that it's so through composed that oh, yeah. it leaves very little space for a anything to go wrong, like your computer, you know, you know, Ableton rig to go down, for example, but b for any opportunity to explore things or play things in any way other than exactly what you did on that recording, which was probably a hundred takes yep. to get to that thing, you know, and and that's. You know that's fine, but there's no there's no exploration. There's no song remains the same version of um, Days and Confused that goes for 32 minutes, for example. <laughs> with those guys. But see, on on the other side of that too, like those guys would look at that and stuff and go like, "Oh, that's that's dumb," and you're old, you don't get it. <laughs> yeah, it's funny that, that this sort of new level of extreme skill is kind of the punk of 2021. It is, isn't it? It really yeah. is. Yeah. I mean, yeah. from, as, a, as a pure guitar fan, like, I love it. Like, I love yeah. to see these, like, guys that have been playing for, you know, five years and are just at such a ridiculous level. Like, oh. just yeah. could play circles around me and I'm looking at it, yeah. you know, and it's just, but there is, as you say, and I know this was this was a big controversy that came through last year about the, the syncing with the MIDI tracks and everything and a lot of mm-hmm. the bands have basically come out and said, no, we don't do that, but, like, I was watching a guitarist the other day and when I first saw it, I can't remember his name, but I was just like, my jaw just was on the floor. Like I thought, yeah. how is that humanly possible to do that? And then I listened yeah. really closely and I was like, oh, it's not. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. so he's, I can't, and I, if I, if I remembered his name, I'd name him because maybe I'm wrong, but sure. um, like, there's absolutely no noise. There's absolutely no string scrapes. There's absolutely yep. no um, uh, expression or glisses on anything. Everything is absolutely perfect at 240 beats a minute, playing you know 30 second notes, playing these arpeggios that are just would be would be super hard at half the tempo, mm-hmm. but there is no noise. There's no there's no sound. Yeah. It's absolutely perfect. And I'm thinking that's either that guy is some sort of absolute savant. Yeah. Or he's cheating. And yeah. if if that's what you want to do, if you want to cheat, not well, if what you're doing is doing that composing thing and you're composing these pieces and this is what you want it to sound like, then go for it. We live in a technological yeah. world, you know, for for anybody yeah. to say you shouldn't use technology is ridiculous. Yeah. But I'd like to see him do it live. Yeah. And then the stress of bit having to do that live. I know for me, when I'm writing something that's technically out there, like I make sure I can do that shit, man. Like I make sure that even that's on right. a bad day, I can pull it off. Yeah, that's it. That's You've got, it. And I mean, for me, I'm you know I I like to I like to play technical stuff that that gets you know that gets my musical blood pumping. Mm-hmm. But I don't ever like put out stuff that's right at the very edge of my proficiency. Like I might write stuff that's at the very edge of my proficiency and then I will practice that till that proficiency is 10% yeah. below what my yes. new proficiency is so that when I go and play yeah. that live, I'm going to be able to play it live. Mm-hmm. I can't see this young crop of like extreme shredders pulling it off outside of like, I don't know if you know of like Jason Richardson and guys like that. Uh, the name rings a bell, but I think that I, I don't think I do know. He's that guy. Him. He's just completely like his neck tats and he's just really like, he has like, um, so the music man guitar and he holds it up really high. I do. Now that you say that, I think I've seen him. I, do, I wouldn't have done his name, but I think I've, I've seen that guy. I've seen that guy and I've seen him play stuff live and it's good. Right. Okay. So there are guys that can do it, but I think if you yep. make your career off that, you've got to, 
you, you've chosen your path. Mm-hmm. And that's a, that's a, that's tricky, right. it's a tricky path to meander, man, because I love having space where I can just play. Yeah, yeah. But also the, the space to be able to like fuck things up too, you know. <laughs> like if, you're, if your audience are so well aware of every single solo that you play, then they're going to be listening. I remember being, I remember, um, being in New York oh, 10 years ago now and um, we saw Jaco Pistorius' son was playing now, Jacob Pistorius' son is also a bass player, but he had the audacity to play Teen Town Whoa. to a bunch of people who probably only went like we did because he was Jacko's son, thinking like, oh, this guy better impress us. He played Teen Town and he fucked it up. Oh, no. Yeah, which, and I remember, there's this like, you know, and it was sort of this like apparent dead silence and all four of us who were there gasped at the same time like, <laughs> and then we suddenly were like shit were we really loud then like has he just heard us oh my like, god he just heard us shame him for fucking up his dad's song but that's the thing like everybody knows that song so well if you're a bass player even if you're a guitarist whatever you know that melody and yep. so if you want to pull it off you better make sure you nail it absolutely or do things that you know, you can play slightly differently every time and then it doesn't matter. Absolutely. I, uh, I remember seeing Radiohead and they cocked mm-hmm. up one of my favorite songs. Some, uh, mm-hmm. what's that? What's it called? Uh, uh, the, the rabbit disease. Mix- oh, mixomatosis. Mixomatosis. They, do, they, do, 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 do. That's yeah. a great tune. But they, they cocked it up. They got, they got, one of them got the loop wrong when they're coming around again. So they, right. and you could see just for like two or three bars, like Tom York was looking around and they were sort of looking at each other and then they locked back into it. Mm-hmm. And that made me love them just a little bit more because yeah, sure. you can see they're actually playing it. They're actually in the moment. They're, they're, mm-hmm. they're, they're experiencing the music. They're sharing. And, it, you know, a lot of their stuff is very heavily processed. They played it. You know, they've got backings and loops and stuff they use, but they're still yeah. playing. And like to watch yeah. them actually train wreck a song for a couple of bars, I was like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That made me love them more. Yeah, that's right. It's kind of the, um, the insurance policy that you get to see that, that, that the band that you love are who they say they are. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. they're human, you know. Yeah. So listen, let's, I, let's I saw, just. I saw a band. Sorry, go on. No, no. Um, so. Let's just talk a little bit about your your sort of journey through this thing. Sure. So, do you remember the um, the time that you sort of had like a musical awakening and said, "Right, this is this is what I want to do," or was it more of a gradual process? Um, I think. Look, being being a um, as I mentioned earlier, being an egomaniac and also being a perfectionist. When I found something that I could do quite well, quite easily, I was like, well, sweet, that's me sorted. <laughs> um, and, you know, I say that, I say that tongue in cheek, but there's an element of truth to that, you know, which is um, I was just able to do it. And, and I never really made, I don't think I made the conscious decision of I'm going to do this or I'm going to really try to do this. As much as I said, I just want, I just want to keep doing this, you know, so I was, like I said, I was doing gigs at school and I played in bands since I was 14. Um, I, I was doing little, I think the first like gig that I did, I think I was 13, 12 or 13. I played at the Apollo Bay Music Festival, Young Songwriters Competition, you know. Awesome. And, um, you know, that, that was, it was a great experience. It was just, it was just exciting to be on stage and I played my songs you know and I, I had my little um actually i had this guitar which is a strat knockoff you know yeah which i still have it's rubbish but i still have for sentimental reasons but that plugged into my tiny little amp with the gain turned up full in drop d playing whatever i was playing and um it was i was hooked you know i i just was like well this is lots of fun yeah you know and people talk about their you know um hearing people yell out or cheer or all that stuff. I don't think it was necessarily that immediately. Um, that certainly became a thing, you know, but um, it was just enjoying playing music and being able to do it. Yep. And 
and then wanting to do it more and wanting to do it better each time, you know. And um, I went to a school that had a, a bunch of other musos at it and we, we either played together or were kind of rivals and egged each other on, you know, and we were constantly, someone was playing something. And this is the other thing about the YouTube generation. I only knew like what Dave could play or what Luke could play or whatever, whoever was at school. And I just had to play that and play that better. <laughs> if you're a 14 year old now and you get on YouTube or Instagram and you, you know, you see a three year old playing the thing that you've been working for six months on, you would give up, you know, yeah, yeah. What's the point, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I imagine that's, that's very hard. I, I've experienced that as a teacher, you know, trying to encourage people to keep going with things, even though someone can do it sooner than them or better than them or younger than them or all of those sort of things. But it was just this like game in a way of like, I just want to keep playing. I want to get more gigs and I want to be able to say that I'm doing more gigs. And, you know, I worked in, um, worked in a music shop and I worked in a cafe and I did those sort of jobs. I don't know, maybe until I was about 21 and then I started doing enough gigs and had enough beginning to teach and that was, that was it. You know, I just, I did that full time, you know, I just, I just taught and I just lived and breathed guitar and music and played lots of gigs and had lots of fun. That's amazing. So who would Still you do have lots of fun? Who would you say was your, um, biggest earliest sort of influence like who did you who sort of got your blood pumping jimmy page nice um, jimmy page was yeah just the whole led zeppelin thing you know um that that sound the black black dog that intro on led zeppelin 4 i just remember that as a very young kid long before i'd even begun music as a pursuit uh i remember that sound and just being quite haunted by this voice you know the, on the, the turntable at mum and dad's place you know and this voice comes the pig scratching then the voice comes in and it's there's this huge drums and huge guitar and it's just like whoa what is that that's awesome and um i i just i played piano i, I sort of played drums nominally um and i just started picking up a guitar and i wanted to learn stairway to heaven and that was i just pushed and pushed and learned i started Get, I got the, the tab books that you had to get back in the day to go to the music shop and get the tab book. And of course, you couldn't just get the one thing, you had to buy the whole book. So it was about, yep. you know, $75 for the whole book. Oh my God. But, but um, that was it, you know, I just, actually guitar magazines too early on, they used to have a lot more songs in them that you could learn, you know, and I, I, I started getting guitar magazines and learning songs in them and, and uh, I mean, I still do read guitar magazines. I just read them on an iPad these days. But it's not the same in terms of, like, having songs printed in them that you would be excited to go, oh, what's in it this month? And it was like um, Sweet Child of Mine was in it and then uh, right next to, like, I don't know, Green Day and then next to Corn. Yeah. Or something. And it's like, something you know, like just, by it, the Smiths or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, these bizarre mix of, of songs, you know. But um, I became then aware of a whole lot more bands. The Smiths is a great example, actually, because, you know, Johnny Marr, that, that yeah. was sort of... I had knew, I knew of the Smiths as being a, an 80s kind of droll band, you know. But then when I saw Johnny Marr talked about in guitar magazines, I thought, oh, well, maybe I should go and listen to them again, you know. And I didn't... I, didn't, I turned around from writing them off so quickly. Oh, absolutely. I, when I, when I first, the first time I ever heard of Johnny Marr was he was on a cover, I think, of Guitar Player or Guitar Techniques. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, you know, well, if he's on there, he must be a bit of a, you know, bit of a shredder. Here's an exciting new thing to sink my teeth into. And I was looking at it going, this is mostly chordal stuff. Who's this idiot? Like, whatever. <laughs> and then, yeah. like, it took me years to go back and actually go, hang on a minute. This guy's doing some really interesting stuff with, like, voicings yeah. and tones and like mm -hmm. effects and stuff like that i remember yeah. that and i remember because i i was sort of in mount isa which was a little country town and there was no mm -hmm. you don't you know you couldn't really you can only see like the circuit bands that came through and yeah. so it was sort of like being in a desert musically and i'd get the um guitar player magazine there was one there was one news agent in mount isa that stocked guitar player magazine so I'd go down every month and I'd buy it. And I got the, I got the little vinyl, the little flexible vinyl. Right. Paul Gilbert doing the, um, 
doing his like picking his right hand picking drills. Yep. And, the sex thing. Yep. And yep. that that little little vinyl off the front of that that one magazine in Mount Isa in like ninety ninety maybe. Yep. Just changed my life. I was like, sure, because I'd never heard of Paul Gilbert. Yeah. Never yep. heard of him. Like I knew I knew about Racer X a little bit, but not really. And then I heard this, and I was like. I'd been playing yep. guitar for like a year or two and that just, yep. that blew my mind and I learned that stuff like backwards and forwards and it was amazing. Sure. And I felt sure. I felt like I'd discovered like like a secret or something really special, you know what I mean? Yep. Yep. Yeah. And, and that was the thing that I think a lot of guitar magazines did uh, on those little CDs or records, as you say, that came on the front was promote a couple of um, artists that, may not have really been well known even if they should have been like for me it was you know I, paul gilbert was probably 10 years later than that he was promoting a particular album called burning organ yeah and it had this tune that came with the guitarist magazine um cd which the song the name of the song now escapes me but it was just this killer riff you know and just he even shredding over it and it was awesome um, Holdsworth was another one that I discovered yes. in the same way. Um, uh, there's an acoustic guitar player called Eric Roche, who is, he, he was around very briefly and then he died, I believe, um, quite young. But, but, you know, he was in this magazine, you know, and, and that, these were the things I put this CD on and go, oh, that's interesting. That's, whoa, what is that? Like, you know, Holdsworth, it was just like, what is going on? I have no idea what this is and I'm really, I'm fascinated. I was just listening yeah. to a bootleg of um, was it was Holdsworth and Gambali? Oh yeah, from like late eighties, doing a thing for like Shrapnel Records. Wow! And it was this, like to be honest, the production of it was just terrible. Like it had all those yeah. really horrible techno synth sounds. Mm -hmm. But then you know, and I mean, I'm I'm a massive Gambali fan. Like Gambali, when I when I first bought the you know, um, when his economy picking. Book. The hot licks thing or whatever it's called. Oh, that, no, it was, a, it was a book that I got. It was his his economy right. picking. Like, you know, I can't remember what it was called. It wasn't called Sweet Not Pick. the Shred, shred Fest or Shred something? No, shred, not shred it was fashion. like Sweet Picking or something or Sweet Economy right. Picking. And I got that book right. and I, you know, that sort of changed, that changed the way I use my right hand. But mm -hmm. I've, I've really always loved Gambali's physical... Uh, attributes and the way he plays I'm not a massive fan of his music a lot of times because it's a bit no. too it gets a bit too obtuse for me mm -hmm. like I love him with Chick Corea and stuff like the electric band and stuff yep. that's amazing yep. but Holdsworth just on another level man like when I heard Holdsworth and it was the same thing it was from a guitar magazine I was like yep. this is an alien beaming in from another yep. planet like what is yeah. that yeah yeah it's it is it, it's incredible and, and I, I understand that Holdsworth's thing was that he wanted to sound like a saxophone yeah and when you, hear, when you think of his tone and the way that he phrases lines you know lots of those fourth jumps and those kind of um unison multi-string things which horn players do with the key changes you know yeah. um or the, the, the whatever they do with it you know they play the same note with a different key anyway it's the, all of those things it's like yep that makes perfect sense that that's what you're trying to imitate yeah his harmony is just next level. Everything's, you know, Liddy and everything. And I don't know if you've ever seen the, those videos of him talking about the chords that he uses. And it's oh, just like, hilarious. They're not chords. No. They're just, what, what is that? Well, he's, you know? got his whole, he's got his own whole system. I sat down and watched a video of him explaining his musical system. Mm. And it's just. It's, it's an old video that is yeah. on a whiteboard. Yeah, it's on a white. He's explaining on a whiteboard. I think it's from like eighty four or something, and yeah, he's just talking yeah. about it. And he's going, "Well, this is like the green tone that I use, and like these notes." And he's he's talking about like, you know, permutations of like, yeah, you know, the Maharashi scale from like you know the fourth century. But it's like mm -hmm. he's incorporated it into a whole system. It it was amazing. I was I when I saw that, I was just, I have I have no idea what you're saying, man. Yeah, <laughs> like literally right. no idea. <laughs> That's it. It's, it's mental. He was apparently so self-conscious that he would be not only kind of critical of himself after a gig, but he'd be almost critical of people who came up to him and said, hey, that gig was great. And he'd be like, something's wrong with you, you know, if you think that. He was apparently really 
sort of sad character. I uh, I can completely relate to that, man. I have that myself at times where people come up and say that mm. was amazing, and you go. I I actually went and sought um I did some coaching on that because a lot of times people come to me and say that was amazing, man. Like what you did there, and I'd be like, "What's wrong with you, bro? Like how yeah. can you like that? That was terrible." Yeah. So, yeah. I think uh, I think if he didn't if he didn't go down the alcoholic path, which I think is the way he ended up going, I mm-hmm. think that's what killed him at the end was the alcohol. Right. He he could have. Um, yeah, well, he named one of his albums the 16 Men of Tain after the Glenn Fiddick, I think. Yeah. After the Scotch. Yeah, so. yeah. He, I think um, I was I was listening to a podcast with a guy, the Riff Hard, like the Riff Hard podcast. Do you, do you listen to that one? Yeah. yeah, no, but anyway. Really good podcast for, for guitar mm-hmm. nerds. And a guy that went in on tour with him was just basically saying he was just a bit like Jacko, you know, like those demons just got too much. Yeah, yeah. Which is, you know, in this time is a very familiar story in 2020, 2021 now. Absolutely. But anyway, before we go yeah. down that road, I just want to make, like, talk a little bit more about your path. So you, you're in your early 20s, you're in Melbourne. Yep. You're gigging. You're starting, yep. you're starting to uh, sort of make a name for yourself around the scene. So where, where do you go from there? Well, then it sort of became this, I don't know, I just, I had this moment of like, well, I, I should, I want to, you know, I want to do the thing that every Australian does, which is go traveling. So I went, I did the European backpacker thing, you know, and I, a friend of mine was living in London at the time and I stayed with him and I got to London and I sort of felt, yeah, this, this place is nice. I could, I could see myself here and, you know, it's everybody knows of that city as its as its cultural and artistic kind of magnetism so i thought oh maybe i'll do this so that was in 2013 and i started talking about this idea then and then i just was like yeah i'm gonna do it i'm gonna do it i'm gonna do it and i had to get the visa i had to be under 31 to get the two-year visa right so that was in 2017 that i turned i would have turned 31 so i was like well i've got to do it I better just do it right now because otherwise I won't get it. So that was that. And I think I decided in February, I got the, got the visa in March and was in the UK by April. I'd quit my teaching job that I'd been at for 10 years. And it was just like, it was time, it was time to go, you know, it was time to shake everything up. And so there I was, and I'm sure that you had a, maybe you had a slightly different experience because you, you got to the UK with your family, whereas I got there on my own and just landed at Heathrow with like a guitar case and a bag. So you're like, what the fuck have I done? <laughs> you know, um, and just be like, uh oh, you know. And then I remember that I'd, I'd shipped my stuff over and it was going to be, it was going to land the next day or within the next couple of days. And I, for, I put the wrong papers on it, so they thought it was an import. So I got charged like a thousand pounds. Oh, no, import tax. Yeah, import tax on my own stuff, which I then had to spend the next like four or five months trying to get back. And I got about eight, seven or eight hundred pounds of it back. Oh my God. But man, it it was just like a real kick in the teeth of this like, oh man, not only is, not only do I not really know anyone over here, I'm staying on my mate's couch for a little while and I've just lost a thousand pounds for nothing. Oh, bro. (laughs) But you know, that's, that's the character building kind of um, experiences. And that was... That was uh, part of the, the, the journey, you know, and then so I landed in London and, and I realized and this was the thing that like in Melbourne, I built over many years, um, uh, like you say, a, a bit of a reputation, but certainly a network. Yep. Um, and I became quite uh, lazy, I guess. It's just like, well, I don't have to try. I'll get gigs, you know, whatever. That's fine. And, and that can be fun for a period of time, but it's certainly you check out mentally. Yep. And so getting to London, there's no laurels to rest on. So you, I had to, I had to get out and prove myself. And I had to also be quite humble and really do some pretty terrible gigs to start with. Cause you have to say yes to everything, you know, um, which was really good because it was sort of like, not only a, like I say, a humbling experience, but also a realization that the grass is not, always necessarily greener yep and it doesn't matter where you are it's about what you do about it and you know what your effort levels are you know 
And so um, on, on a sort of a side note about London, like London, I don't think was anything like what I hoped it was going to be or I thought it was going to be. Um, and musically, I don't think that it necessarily I, it changed my life being there. But on a personal level, on a completely separate thing, like London is, has, it did amazing things for me on a, on a personal level, you know, and, um, and, and a big part of that was sort of just being a little bit made aware that you are not um, as invincible and awesome as you think you are. Uh, take a chill pill, you egomaniac. <laughs> uh, which, which I can maybe co-think being uh, in London, but also being, you know, getting into your 30s. I think you start it's... Really I think um, have, like having have, I met you in London. I didn't know you before, mm-hmm. and we met, and and I've seen you play, and you're a fantastic guitar player and a really good singer and a great songwriter. So, Thank you. it's it's really interesting because a lot of people I know that have moved here, I think it's as much about the support network as anything. And I think, you know, I've I've personally known quite a few musicians who have moved here. And then, you know, it's it's really hard, man. If you're by yourself, if you move yep. over here by yourself, it's probably, you know, outside of uh, you know, the material needs, hunger, housing. It's one of the I think it's one of the toughest things to do because you're basically saying, "Here I am. This is what I have. Do you want me?" And, yeah. it, and it takes an incredible level of vulnerability and openness to actually put yourself out there. And especially after you're, you've established a career and you have that support network. Because I know how it feels. You know, I didn't, yep. you know, for, for, I think I was a professional musician for like 10, 12 years before I moved to the UK. Mm-hmm. And I'd got, built myself to a position where I literally never, ever had to look for a gig people would come to yep. me like that was yep. that's what would happen yep. and when i moved here probably similar to yourself it was a shock and but it was a shock that i wanted because like yeah. like you i'd st- not like no not like you i had felt that i was becoming lazy i had felt that i yep. was not pushing myself i had felt that i was getting comfortable mm-hmm. and then to come and confront that head on like the stories always say it should be you know you should have this moment and it should be like this crystallizing moment and the music rises in the background and you know you start another path you know i'm sure that happens to some people yeah but i found it fucking tough man like super tough the first probably the first two years sort of a lot of anxiety a lot of sleepless nights going Oh, I'm not as good as I think I am. I'm actually not. Yeah. Like, yeah, you know. And I mean, probably in in Brisbane, where I'm from, it's a bit of a different scene. I think in Melbourne they place a lot more emphasis on originality, and you know, you know, you've you've in the Melbourne music scene. Maybe, bit, maybe more so than Brisbane, but certainly not. You know, it's certainly not the the sort of. There's still the same kind of thing of like, play something we know. Yeah, and I and I knew that I got to the point in Brisbane where I just hated performing. Like I just did not yeah. enjoy it. And f- for me, it was a decision of whether I stop playing music or make a change. You know what I mean? So, and it was it was very confronting to actually hit that head on and go, "Hang on, this is not this is not what I expected." Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I think the I think the reason that I've managed to stay in this country there's two reasons one reason is i have my family with me and i'm not just going to uproot my children mm-hmm. you know i can't that's very irresponsible <laughs> i've yeah. already uprooted sure. them once i shouldn't do it more than yeah. once that's yeah. and then also i had a support network so my wife was here yeah and you know i always had someone to talk to if times were tough whereas if you're by yourself if you don't sometimes if you don't have that person at 3 a.m when when it's a you know it's one of those bleak nights mm-hmm you know, it, it can change the course of your life. Absolutely. Yep, that's right. It really can. It really can. So and I think the, you, know, you say that it's, it is that like big, that big step and that big sort of risk that you take of like living um, kind of with your own thoughts for 
at least at least a year to, before you get a few people who maybe you can because it's you know it's different like whatsapp or calling someone on the phone it's not the same mm. as being able to just sit with someone and and it takes time to create those people who you don't feel like you're imposing on their life by saying hey what are you up to you know because you're new in the world you know yeah absolutely um, and I, I was i was really fortunate to find a great group of people that I will have as my friends forever, you know, being over there, both musical and non-musical as well. Really amazing fluke of the first house that I lived in where we became very close. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's wild to think that, you know, huh, I can go to the other side of the world and make friends with people. Like, that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty awesome. You know? And mm. so with all this time that you were like, in in melbourne and you were building your career and then you moved to the uk were you writing and recording original material i was i was i've been doing that forever i'm i'm looking at the side here if i've got any physical copies of anything because i i um, physical still have copies of like yeah i know it's <laughs> incredible isn't it? i still have copies of you know like my first some of my first bands cds you know from I think probably the first CD I made was in 2004, you know, and we hand, or, you know, we, we individually burnt every single one of them and yep. we printed the covers, you know, and, and that was, you know, that was cool. Like, and I still, I still certainly still got all of those songs on a hard drive here, you know? Yep. Um, I remember those days you know, of before, just before you go to the festival, you, you got the printer and you go to the printer, you've got to cut up the things and you've, you've got the CD printer going in the next room and you're trying to, yeah. you're trying to pack them all before the festival. I yeah. remember those days. Yeah. Yeah. And you're trying to, trying to make it look like you didn't make it yourself. <laughs> uh, which of course now there's some, there's, there's a whole movement of, you know, this, this, well, I mean, I was probably always there. I'm maybe just aware of it now of, people who deliberately try to make things um, as uh, one-off and um, mistake-ridden as they can because it's sort of more authentic, you know, so every CD print is slightly differently because they've done it themselves, you know. The, the words the but, words bespoke and artisan pop up a lot. Yes, exactly right, yeah. Artisan, artisan CDs, yeah. you know. Uh, bespoke uh, tape, you know, that's yes. tape making your resurgence. But um, we really wanted to look, you know, the business. So we made sure that our CDs looked as cool as possible. And we were photographed exclusively in front of graffitied walls. Uh -huh. uh, you know, all of those. Oh, yeah, man. Been there. Dates. Everybody like. I mean, I, I say this now. Um, I, I, my, my photos on both of the recent things that I've put out, I'm not looking at the camera. But, I was, you know, you're always sort of. Looking away, and that's your cool pose. That was, you know, everything had to be serious and cool. And and I'm only just getting out of that. I have to. I had to admit it. But, but 20 years later, I'm only just getting out of that. Like it doesn't have to be that. I'm not that cool anymore. <laughs> not that I ever was. But it's just it's just hilarious how serious um, you take yourself at that age. But yeah, I, I was writing music and. I always have really written because I've just, I've always had something going in my head. I, I said to my partner um, recently, you know, I was like, there are people in the world, because she's a musician as well, there are people in the world who don't, who aren't distracted by melodies all of the time. You know, I'm like writing something, it's -na 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 -na. constantly. Yeah. And so um, it's just funny for me to think that there are people out there who aren't like that, you know who aren't constantly humming or singing or thinking of songs or thinking of chord progressions or, or, or playing rhythms, you know, hearing. We've just got a dog and the dog um, drinks in like a 3-2 clave. Cluck, 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 cluck. And, you know, that's what I hear that. I don't mean to, but it's, that's how it goes. That's beautiful. Yeah. So you, you've, just, you've just put something out, haven't you? I just put two things out, I was going to say, with, you, with, you, with the... With your, female vocalist who is your, also well, your partner yes, is that right that is, yes that is my partner so that's one of the um again we'll come back to this but that's one of the upsides of 2020 for me um but yes yeah, so i just put out a new record for, under my own name which um has been sort of kicking around for a long time it had a lot of false starts 
Um, I had a uh, cyst on my vocal cords in 2018, which I thank the NHS for providing me with the surgery. Um, I remember talking to you about it, man. That was that was yeah, tough. Yeah, yeah, it was. It, it was. I mean, it was. It was also that was a wake up call too. Of like, hey, dickhead, you can't not sleep and smoke and. Um, you know, abuse your voice and not warm up and not do any of these things and expect it to um, bounce back like it did when you were 18. It's just not going to do that. So, you know, that that was like, all right, well, I better get this surgery. And then that made me quit smoking, which was really good. Um, but it also made me just rethink. I had to rethink the record of the keys that I tried to choose. I had to go to a vocal coach who said, stop trying to be a tenor. You're not a tenor, you're a bass baritone and you need to sing to that range. You know, your, your D and your E should be towards the top. Your G should be when you're feeling great and your A when you're feeling only absolutely amazing and should only be used once in a gig. Don't try to sit a verse at E and wonder why you're straining and not sounding, you know. And I also, I just didn't, I'd never, you know, I'd sung for years, but I'd never really had any lessons. So yeah. I was singing, uh, you know, five gigs a week. So, for, like, you know, up, up to like 15, when I think about it, it's like 15 or maybe sometimes 18 sets a week. You know, when you're doing three set gigs and just thinking, oh, yeah, but it's not, it's not a very long gig. It's like, yeah, but that's an enormous amount of singing in a week, week oh, yeah. in, week out. You know, and so it just, my voice went, you know, and so that made the record, I had to rethink and I had to, you know, I had come back to Australia and I recorded some more with the boys here and I changed some um, parts around when I was here briefly in 2018. And then I kind of decided, no, I don't want to do this anymore. So it went on the back burner. And then one of the, the, um, the guy who, who engineered it, Fraser Montgomery, he emailed me, which I think was an equal parts like, hey, I think this record is good and um, that and a business development call on his part of like, hey, we should finish that record because, you know, um, you're going to pay me to mix it, you know. Uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, it spurred me into gear. And um, I was like, yeah, you know what? I listened to it again. I was like, you yeah, know what? Let's do it. So at the end of 2019, I went into Silver Shark Studios on your recommendation and did one of the vocals um, for, for one of the songs, which... Uh, well, I released at the start of 2020 and then the shit hit the fan and I thought, well, I better get the rest out. So I, I was stuck at home in Australia and, um, and had time to actually sit down and do the record and think about it. So I did all of the overdubs and all of the extra vocal parts and all of the extra synth and obviously all the extra guitars and everything and I just put it all together and I just enjoyed the process and then... Finally, it came out uh, in early February. Amazing, man. Mm, mm. And how did you fight Silver Shark? It was great. Uh, Grant is a really lovely dude. Yeah. Um, I ended up, I did some live, like I did some filming stuff in there, but um, I've only got some of it out. Not, be, not for any other reason than I just, I never got the footage off Chris who filmed it before I left the UK. Right. And uh, we just haven't arranged for him to send me all the footage yet, you know, and so I might, I might do something with them in the future. But, um, but it, was, it was good just to, like, get back in, a, in an actual studio and start the process again. And that really began, like, oh, okay, I better do this. So when I came back to Australia, I was like, well, I better get in the studio again, you know, because there's something about the studio as a place to be you know, it's not here. It's not like, oh, I'll just, I'll go and the dog's barking or I'll go and do something else or we, we need to go and we'll go and get a coffee or whatever. You're like, you're there to do the job. And it's that's, a place to work. Yeah. That's why, that, that's I, why I like to do, go to the gym because it's, sure. it's a place where you go to do a thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that that changes your mindset a, li a little totally. bit. Totally. Totally. Because I know for me, I do a lot of recording at home because of, you know, you, you can do that now. You can just plug your guitar in and dial mm -hmm. in some cool sounds and record and you can play the bass and everything at home. And if you're, you know, get your keyboards out, do the pads. If you're a musical person, it's a really lovely thing. But yes. I, I think if you go to a place and the clock's ticking, you've got a budget, it actually yeah. 
can crystallize and clarify a lot of ideas you might have had because I you know for me I'm a little bit of a person that I'll chip away at an idea and go oh it's done oh hang on yeah, yeah, and yeah. Then it's just one yeah. more thing. Oh, hang on. I'll just put one. Oh, hang on. And then you're like yeah. six months later and the songs, it's no better. No. <laughs> it's just but more. It's, it's more delayed. Yeah. It's just like, you but know, sometimes yeah. if you go yeah. into a room and you've got to track these songs in this time, because yeah. you can't afford to spend any more money, you might strip away that extra shit that pretty much no one pays attention to anyway. Totally. And it, it, it can come out better. Yep. Yeah. I Absolutely. Think, I think, and I think, you know, over 2020, that wasn't something that was happening a lot, but hopefully, you know, and I know for you in Australia, it's much better. Well, it's better now. We're, I mean, we're having this sort of summer that, that you had in the UK, which is where everyone thinks, oh, everything's fine. Yeah. Now we've got the vaccine. I assume that everything will stay pretty fine going forward, but, you know, it is coming into winter, so who knows? There's, I've seen a lot more people with colds again, you know? Yeah. And that's just, that's the beginning of these things, Yeah, you know. So, well, that, well that's, that seems an organic place to go. So, just walk us through your experience of COVID because you you were here when it started? So, I was I was here, I was in Australia. I was getting a new visa. Right, so, that's I came right. here for Australia. I was here in Australia for a month or so getting a new visa. And... Um, I was due to fly back to the, and I got the visa, and I was due to fly back to the UK on the 12th of March, oh. which was the day that Scott Morrison said all Australians who are overseas should come home. Oh. And I was flying out that day. So I had to go, I had to land in the UK to get the BRP, the residence permit. Um, and I had 10 days to do that either side or, or after my um, arrival date. And half, like almost half was still in the UK. I had to go back anyway to get it, even wow. if I was going to turn around and come home. So I was like, okay, well, I'll just go. So I went. Um, now, in that time that I was here, I met Sally as well. Oh, really? Thought, oh. I thought, oh, that's a shame. Like, we would have been a really nice couple. Uh, oh, well, I'm going back to the UK. That's that. Such as life. Uh, such as life. And... Um, yeah, then, then I was there and, and the 24 hour plane ride over from Australia to London, um, by the time I turned my phone back on, it was just like, oh, this is cancelled, that's cancelled, that's cancelled. The next few months, it was just like, uh oh, this is looking grim, you know? Oh my God. And I thought, I can last a couple of months financially, like I could last a couple of months, you know? I wasn't sure, I knew I couldn't get. Um, help from the British government because my my visa had one stipulation on it, which was no access to public funds. That's oh. all it said. Oh, and then I wasn't sure what I was going to get from the Australian government being over there. Um, meanwhile, I was also in this house with um, four people who we, we weren't um, enemies by any stretch, but we certainly weren't friends. You know, we just lived together. It was a share house. And yeah, it was a share house. You know, it was different, as I said, different than my first share house where we all got along. But I had a room that was maybe this size, except it had a bed in it. It had my clothes in it. It had my little tiny desk in it. And, you know, and it was, it would have been four of us in this tiny flat. I don't know how I would have played guitar or made noise or done any recordings with them all working from home. And that, and my brother got on the phone to me and he's like, you've got to just get home. Airlines are going to collapse. The world, you know, we're going to hell in a handbasket, you know. So, okay, I made the decision. And 23rd of March, I think on the 22nd of March, I got on a plane at a very, very eerily empty Gatwick airport oh, and left. Man. Yeah, it was crazy. Um, it was what a hell a, of a... What a horrendous experience, man. Well, yeah, it, I mean, it, look, it was at the time and I hated the fact that I couldn't say goodbye to, to people that I made friends with in the UK. There was a few people that lived locally who I could see in a park, but really, like, I couldn't really see anyone and I just had to disappear, you know. And that that's a shame, but, you know, as I said, like, I came back to... I didn't have to do hotel quarantine at the time. It was only home quarantine, so I had to nominate where I was and it got checked out, you know. But, um, you know, it was a couple of weeks before they introduced mandatory hotel quarantine. Right. 
So I got home to my parents' place and um, they sort of put me in this top part of the house and said, you're not allowed to come downstairs, which meant I wasn't allowed to go into the kitchen. So I had meals brought to me for two weeks and I had, you know, it was, it was a dream. It was an absolute dream. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, that, that quickly ended. That was, you know, that was a short lived, but it was a nice two weeks for what it was wow. just being brought. And, um, you know, in that time, I, I sort of, I started playing again. I, I had all my guitars again. I started, I, I like didn't have to learn any songs for a gig. I didn't have to, you know, I didn't have to play that same song again. And you can insert whatever song there. I didn't have to think, oh, I learned that song once. How does it go again? Here's 20 minutes or half an hour of my life gone. It was just like, oh, I can just start playing and start recording. I had, I had my gear and my laptop and my interface and that's all you need to start making music so I started recording again and then um, you know in meeting Sal and then in, uh, in sort of us ending up together she had sort of begun rediscovering her own songwriting and um, and we started working together on some of her songs you know which are all they're, they're great she's a fantastic songwriter and I just got to do the to sort of um, producer thing you know and just think about like just play the instruments and just have I just had a good time doing that anyway that then turned into this new project called Elbird that um, is sort of a vehicle for sell songwriting and a um, chance for me to be a drummer again oh, even wow. if that means having to go into Pro Tools and really edit some of my <laughs> kicks and you know just no just don't tell anyone but I'm not as good as drummer <laughs> I think I am. And when you see that on a grid, you can, uh, you, you, it's really, that's really humbling as well. Yeah, the, the quantized reality of the modern musical uh, world yeah. doesn't really give, yeah. much, uh, give much leeway for expression. <laughs> it gave me a lot more respect for like Stevie Wonder or Paul McCartney or people who did record all of their instruments and still locked in with each other, yep. with, with themselves. You know, the, all the instruments are together, whereas... Uh, my guitar playing, my bass playing, my piano playing, they're all pretty good, but my drumming's a little bit behind, you know, they all push, my, yep. naturally I push on those instruments, my drumming I'm a bit behind, you know, and so most of it's fine, you know, but um, there are bits where it's just like, oh, I can't. It's always the drummer, to, mate, it's always the drummer. That. I know, and when the drummer is you, <laughs> it's just the worst. That's amazing. But, uh, it's, it's been really fun, it's been a great experience, and, and we... Um, We've been, you know, writing and really enjoying the writing process. And of course, you know, um, both really working closely with someone in that um, for the first time for both of us, you know, like we, she, she had written a lot um, in her life, but had never really, she's never really released much. And I've, I've sort of never really worked closely writing with someone else, you know, so it's kind of a new experience for both of us. And we're bringing different things to the table. Um, and it's really, it's great. It's, it's a really good team. That's amazing, man. So actually, yeah. in a lot of ways, the, the, the actual experience of the, of the pandemic has, has, been a, has been a positive for you. As I go back into doing Saturday night gigs again, I realized how much I enjoyed not working on Saturday nights all throughout 2020. I was like, you know what? This, this nine to five caper, this fucking finish at five o'clock on Friday and don't start again until nine o'clock on Monday. I could get quite used to that. So there's certainly been a, a, a feeling of like, well, what am I, are we going back to Am I going back to that life? I'm not sure I really want to, you know. Um, I'm, rest, I'm wrestling moment, with that myself at the moment. Yeah, yeah. It's finding that balance at the minute, you know. Yeah. Sal and I have both gone back to like hectic gig schedules. And, um, you know, Sal works, works full time. I work, I now work in, in an um, office job a couple of days a week or, you know, a, a non-musical job a couple of days a week. I teach again. We've just got a dog. I've just gone back to started back at uni as well. You know, it's just like, holy crap! I've just bitten off a lot more than I can chew again. But, you know, that's that's all just that's the juggling that that I've done forever. You know. Yeah, I know. I know. Up, yeah. I know. For me, the um, the whole being home Friday Saturday night thing was actually, and being around my being around my family on Friday Saturday night was actually, yeah. it's been great. Mm -hmm. like really lovely 
Like it's just, it, my children their entire life have never had their dad home on a Friday, Saturday night. Like the odd yeah. Friday here, maybe if something got cancelled last minute or, yeah. but I'm, you know, like their whole lives, they've never spent time with me like that. Mm -hmm. I've done the day stuff, so I've I've always done like the drop offs to school and the taking to clubs and you know hanging out through the week and making snacks in the afternoon and cooking dinner. But I'm not the guy that hangs out on a Friday night and watches movies with them. That's just not that. And now I am, and it's it's actually lovely. Yeah, I really I really like it. (laughs) Yeah, and this and this sort of there's those moments where you know like both both Sal and I have have kind of realized like we missed a lot of time without families you know um on on things you know like i i didn't go to various events because i was working you know and my family really really good they understand that and they've never complained about that they've always been incredibly supportive but both of us have come back to this life of like oh actually it's really nice to see family um more than just in passing yeah yeah you know and so that's that's been cool as well yeah, isn't that fascinating? Yeah, it's it's. Mm. Well, I'm 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 glad you. And how did you go with the second lockdown in Melbourne? Well, the second lockdown was the pretty was the brutal one. That was the hundred and thirty days or something, and that was you know that was. I don't know. It was a challenge, but at the same time, like, I was I had landed a, a teaching job, where, so I was teaching on Zoom, at a school, which was incredibly fortunate. Um, and so I was also on the, the first round of job keeper, you know, so really I was living a much slower paced life and really, you know, I'm not, I'm not known for my natural kind of laissez faire attitude. I'm a bit of a stress head. So li- living that kind of slow paced life was, was probably really good for me. Whereas now back in the fast paced life, even though like my heart tells me like this is what you want to be doing you want to be as busy as you possibly can the reality is that i i don't have the i'm not very good at the at the um actually living that life because i get very stressed by things you know and i i I mean i'm lucky that i've got sal to call me out on it quite a lot but you know it is it is one of those things where i was like i i quite enjoyed this very slow pace of life it sort of made me want to move to the country. When I moved back to Australia, I did some work on my uncle's farm, you know, before I had anything lined up. And I was like, fuck, hard yakka throughout all the day and then just dead quiet at night. I was like, this is, why do we strive to live in cities, you know? The air is really clear out here. Um, I, I just go, and I mean, I was, I was just digging holes, but hey, that was, it was an enjoyable experience for a couple of weeks, you know, just every day just wake up with the sun, you know, go out and dig holes until I couldn't dig them anymore and then come home, there's come a, back to ride a four wheel motorbike back to the, uh, to the, to the house. It was great. There's a song in that, mate. Oh, totally. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't written it yet, but it, it's absolutely in there. It's in my, it's in my next, um, uh, I'm older, not cooler and not trying to be anything. I'm not album due yeah. slated release in 2028 <laughs> given the pace that i release things well you can mark me down for one of those as well mate all right cool <laughs> it comes with a free lego guitar <laughs> so listen what's your what's your hope for the future of music what what do you hope people will will either change or realize um out of these this position that we're in at the moment so what i hoped and I, I use that in the past tense because it seems to have been already slightly thwarted. I hoped that um, musicians would realise that it was worth not doing so many gigs. And I don't want to badmouth wedding gigs or private event gigs, but they're, they're um, locked to a certain group of people that you don't get anywhere from doing them. You know, they make you money, but you don't get there's no no one's like instagramming the wedding band and and then finding you afterwards to go and listen to your original music so i hoped that musicians would be like you know what i want to do more gigs that are um you know uh, uh, up at the the pub and blue uh, playing playing a blues gig on a saturday night you know and all of these sort of more fun certainly less financially rewarding but more fun and more potentially career advancing gigs 
And I hoped that was going to be the case, and I hoped that musicians would have found um, other sources of income in the t nine or 12 months without gigs. Um, and then we wouldn't have to make those decisions, but like I have been sucked back in hard to the, hey, are you available Saturday night, we've got a wedding, are you available, we've got a da da da. And it's just like, yep, yep, yep. It's like, shit, I've done exactly what I hoped wouldn't happen. Yeah, right. So maybe we'll just balance out a little bit eventually, but um, yeah, I, I hope that we, we begin to remember why we got into it in the first place, which certainly wasn't to play horses or. Um, don't look back in anger, maybe in your case over there, <laughs> you know, to, to Bogans who then get angry at you for stopping, yeah. um, you know, at the end of your five hour gig, yep. what you going home? I just got up, <laughs> um, you know, and that's, that's not why I got into it certainly, but I've been lucky that I've been back, you know, recording and, and playing music, writing music, playing things for fun. That's why I got into it, you know, like sitting, sitting in a room is what I did when I was 15 or 14 and, and noodling, you know, and playing and, and enjoying that process. And, and I've been doing that a lot more than I did in certainly the last five or six years. That's awesome, man. Well, that's, that sounds like a very good sentiment to me. Yeah. Trying to find the spark again. Yeah, just just find, just remember why we all started doing it, you know, and, and, and find what makes it fun for us, you know, because the job can take the fun out of it. And that's, that's never a good thing. You know, yeah, well, I've actually, I mean, said, I've actually said that to quite a few people like, um, yeah, you know, would you recommend becoming a professional musician? And I say, well, you know, if you make anything a job, Mm. Unless you're doing it, ex unless you are completely autonomous and making your own rules and people are giving you money for that, mm. a job always has its ups and downs. So yeah. if you if you yeah. happen to fall into a place where, you know, you were in that band or you had that song and you can then make your own, what, make your own rules. If, if you're, whatever you do is if it becomes a job where you have to, lock into things and follow the rules and and compromise a lot it it's a job and yeah. Yeah. you know some people aren't suited to that in music and that's and, right you know and i think the idea of the, most people's um idealized version of music is to be like this guy or girl that sits around and just you know rolls out of bed at four in the afternoon lays down some fat beats, gets paid like 4,000 pounds and then goes to the club, you know, like that's, yeah. that's the idealized version. But a lot of the actual, the day-to-day -day stuff of being a musician is working on, literally working on the craft, not, not, not the, not the spark. So you, you're practicing, you're learning songs, you're, you know, you're, 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 you're figuring yeah. out new technology, you're, you're buying yep. gear, you're looking at stuff yep. online. Like a lot of that is like any other job. It's just the meat and potatoes, man, you know. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. hopefully, hopefully, if you can just stumble into that dream position where you can just do that, what I just described, Andy, then we'll have this conversation later. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll tell you the secret, I'll tell everybody the secret of how to get there when, when I figure it out. And, you, and you'll sell a billion books? Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> That's right. Listen, now let's uh, let's finish up with the speed round now. Okay. And I say that, and it's almost never a speed round. So, um, okay. so it's a, just a few questions about music and general stuff like that. So, who's oh. your who's your favorite artist right now? Uh, I think my favorite artist is a singer and guitarist called Theo Katzman, who plays in Wolfpack. Right. But he he writes his own stuff too, and he. We talked about the Deep Purple album earlier that's just an exciting live album to listen to. He's got this live in Berlin album and he's going for things. He's got Joe Dart playing bass with him, you know, and so it's the band is cooking. And um, and uh, Lee Pardini from Doors, yep, the sort of old country band Doors, uh, he's playing keys with him. You know, it's a killer band and they just they just go for things and he's, he tries stuff out. You know, you can hear him just trying stuff and having fun. And that's cool. I, so I, I dig that. I dig that he's doing things differently to his records. I dig that there's no track, that it's all live, that it's all there. They're filling in, you know, I, I have his albums and they're filling in parts that are, I don't know, the mandolin part 
is not being it's not a mandolin on track you know it's just Lee Pardini plays that part on the keyboard or, or the other guitar player plays it on the guitar you know they take the studio thing and turn it into a live thing which I, anyone who does that I, I enjoy that's cool man. I enjoy, you know, yeah, you have that to send me the link I will what's your um what's your favorite song right now my favorite song right now um Oh, I'm going to have to say it is uh, The Light by L Bird or Can't Wait to Bin Begin by Andy McGarvey. That's the right answer. That is. Brilliant. Great yeah. songs. Great songs. Very good. What was, what was the last song you listened to? Uh, the last song I listened to, let me just flick this up here. Uh, no, it's not there. I've been listening to this band that, that, came, that um, came to my attention for some bizarre reason that they'd sold out all these nights at um, one of the bigger venues in Melbourne and I'd never heard of them. I was just like, who are these guys, you know? They're a band called Lastlings. Now, they're not anything like what I usually would listen to. They're a brother-sister duo and they do like electronic music and you listen to it and basically they've just got a mini Moog or a mini Moog, um, you know, uh, emulation and just basically made sounds on it and they've got cool sort of dark dance beats to it. Like I say, it's not usually what I listen to, but it's sort of, it, there's some cool things going on and I, I enjoy that kind of, I enjoy getting out of those traditionally guitar-y things sometimes and just yeah. going, oh yeah, that synth sounds sick. Or yeah, that four on the four floor kick when it comes in against that synth pattern is why that works, you know? So awesome. I'd say Last Blings was the, was the last thing I listened to. Awesome, and what was the last album you listened to from start to finish? Um, aside from my own, of course, uh, it would be, um, I recently listened again to D Last in the Comatorium by the Mars Volta because they have just come out and said that they're reissuing all their stuff on vinyl. Uh, and so when I saw their picture, I hoped maybe they were releasing new stuff. Um, but I went back to that album, which is one of my top five albums of all time. Right. And listen to that start to finish. And that, that album just blows my mind. That's one of those albums that you just... I remember hearing that. And, and this is in the days of you'd go to the CD shop and say, can I check this out? You know, they'd give you the headphones. And I remember putting on the start of it and just, just being like, holy crap, this is awesome, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and that album I could listen to on repeat. That's Amazing. a desert island for me. I think I saw... I think I might have seen them at the Big Day Out. Did they do the Big Day Out? One year. Yeah, but they, they didn't, I don't think, but At The Drive-In did. At and The Drive-In, that's who I saw. Those two guys were At The Drive-In. Yeah, I saw At The Drive-In. In 2001, they were there. Yeah, they were, they were amazing. Yeah, they, they're also an incredible band. They just don't. They just didn't have John Theodore on the drums, you know, absolutely cutting sick. Like that, just, and Rick Rubin produced that album too, yeah. so it's just, it's just so good. I just love it. Awesome, man. Okay, so what's a... What's a song do you wish you had written? Oh, there's quite a number of them. I think um, virtually anything by the Beatles. Uh, but um, there are some, I don't know. The, what, there are just, I think there are too many to say. But yeah, I, I put on Beatles songs and just think, wow, like, you, you know, it's the song Something, for example, it yeah. just, it's in C and it just does this like, has the cool secondary dominant thing, it goes to the D and then suddenly it's in A, you know, and we're in A and then it's like down, 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 and we're back in C. Yeah. And you just think, whoa, you're like, there, there's so much movement in what's going on without ever grossly straying from the original idea. And that's the Beatles and McCartney especially, I think, can do that incredibly. So... I'd say anything by the Beatles. That's a that's a that's a solid answer, man. What was yeah. um what's your favorite um guilty pleasure artist? Some something that other people might think is cheesy that you put on. Oh. Um I really don't mind some like really cliche pop dance music. I think that there, there was an, an so there's an element of like I grew up uh, at a time when sort of like the, the, I don't know, it wasn't really techno, but it was sort of that like p real pop dance thing that's, you know, that was like 2000, early 2000, 2004. 
that was everywhere when I was just beginning to go out to pubs and clubs, you know, and so even though I don't, I, I didn't like it at the time because, you know, I was, you know, I don't listen to, um, you know, wh whoever it was, Fat Boy Slim, I mean, he's an exception really, but even like um, that, you know, that ma, 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 oh, da, 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 you know, yeah, these yeah. like bad dance songs, but they were around when I was in my formative years. So I, 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 they come on and I just think, yeah, this is actually, I really enjoy this stuff. And then the other one, of course, is in the same ilk, or for the same reasons at least, is Limp Biscuit. I grew up, I was 14 when Limp Biscuit was sort of came out. And Man, $3 bill, $3 bill. Oh. But it's so, it's so, it's abrasive, it's misogynist, it's terrible music, and yet it just rocks, you know, they, you put on Nicky, Nookie and, and, um, and Break Stuff and those kind of albums, and I'm suddenly 14 again, and, and having a great time just learning how to tune my guitar as low as possible. Bro, I was, I was a bass low. player in a new metal band. Awesome. I know That's exactly what you, what you mean. Yeah, I reckon I've seen photos <laughs> yeah. Oh, even a video of you recently playing with, with long hair. Quite possibly. About. There, there's yeah. several people pushing horrible, uh, slanderous things around. We shan't mention them. <laughs> but uh, no, I know what you mean. Limp Biscuit. I, you know, but this was, you know, same thing, late 90s, early 2000s. And mm -hmm. it was just, you know, I was right, you know, young man full of testosterone and rage yeah yep. and that and that music yep. really spoke to me actually the limp biscuit three Absolutely. three dollar bill like i heard that and i was like that you know where's Borland on guitar he's a yeah he's an amazing guitar player mm. it doesn't play yeah. solos per se like completely not the guitar player that i would ever try to be or like no. would usually listen to but that he's a he's a really great like and some of those songs are pretty well composed absolutely they are. yeah yeah there's a lot of, a lot of thought went into especially the Especially the significant other album, um, a lot of commercial thought went into how to push this. Oh know? yeah, I mean, it, it did help that Fred Durst was relatively high up in, in Interscope Records at the time, I believe. Yeah, but um, nonetheless, they had the right people behind them and the right producers, and that sound is huge. Those particular drum sounds and that particular like Mesa Boogie triple rectifier sound, you know, it's. It's a, it's a thing, you know, and, and it kicks ass. And like I say, it's still, I still uh, quietly, but nonetheless internally like raging. Listening oh, yeah. to Limp Bizkit. I, st I, threw, I threw that album on not that long ago, actually, probably like six months ago or something. Yeah. And some of it you listen to and you're like, oh, bro. Yeah. Oh, man, the lyrical content. But oh. like, but a lot of it, you still go on it. Yeah, it takes you back to a time and a place. Absolutely. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Okay, so final question: If I could wave a magic wand, what other what other skill would you like to have outside of music? Um, well, if it was to be like immediately, I would like to have um, I would like to be a better uh, student because I'm still very much a last minute um, kind of oh shit, I didn't read all of this stuff and I've got essays to write and that sort of thing. But I think um, in general, I think if you'd uh, wave the magic wand i think i'd just like to be a little bit better at being uh present in things you know i'm a bit i i get way ahead of myself and i'm down the line a long way and worrying about things that haven't happened yet and i and it's a, it's a it's a personal problem of mine and uh you know i just look at some people who just exist in the moment and just everything will be fine and i'm i'm quite jealous of them so if you could do that for me, that'd be great. Well, once I do that for you, I'll do that for me, mate. We'll be fine. Yeah, great. great. <laughs> All right, mate. Well, it's been a pleasure to chat to you. Absolutely. And where can people find out more about you? Uh, you can go to andymagavi.com. That's probably the easiest. Or Instagram is it's Andy McGarvey. Uh Or similarly, you could go to lbirdofficial.com or Instagram for either of those two bands. How do you spell that? And E double L E bird. Cool. Yeah. Great, mate. Well, um, yeah, as I said, great to chat to you. Yeah, you and, too. Uh, I'll hopefully be coming for a visit next year, so we might have to chat, catch up in Melbourne. I've got to. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, we'll meet halfway in in the Central Coast or something like that. Sounds good. Yeah. Byron or somewhere like that, or. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Sounds nice. wicked, man. All right, bro. We'll have a great uh, have a good sleep because it's late over there for you. Thanks, and yeah. Uh, hopefully, uh, yeah. I'll see you on a stage soon. Sounds good.
Cheers, mate. All right, that's finished recording, bro. Great.